good. Today is February 18th, 2015, and my name is Jerry Hill. I'm interviewing David Wilson in the Oklahoma Conference Ministry Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. This interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and in the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. It will also be available online on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Mm. <clears throat> David, thanks for taking uh, mm. time away from your Welcome. responsibility to be mm -hmm. with us today. Uh, can you share some personal information about yourself, uh, your parents, where you grew up, your tribal affiliation, and some of your sure. early formative experiences? Yeah, I grew up, uh, grew up in uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma, and uh, in my junior year in high school, we moved to the small town of Okay, Oklahoma, population 600, where I finished high school. With my, all my family lives today. My mother still living and uh, siblings, there's seven of us, so they live in Okay and Fort Gibson area. I remember the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. My father, who was full-blooded Choctaw, whose uh, uh, grandparents would have been removed from Mississippi to Indian Territory and our family, his uh, father and grandfather who donated land to one of the very first uh, Indian Presbyterian churches near Eagle Town, Oklahoma. Yeah. You've experienced Methodism as, as obviously <coughs> as a Native uh, American. How are the spiritual values, traditions, and worship forms uh, different or unique to Native American churches? I think this, the spiritual forms and the spiritual forms and the ways of worship in the Indian Methodist churches, the churches vary from tribe to tribe and place to place. If you visited the eastern part of the state, you'll see that uh, influence of the early assimilation from the five tribes, uh, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, Seminoles, and Cherokees, uh, and, and, and the way that the, the people early on really incorporated, took on everything in terms of the church. And so when you visit some of the churches from the eastern side of the state, they're very much like any other United Methodist church you would visit. If you travel among the northern churches and the western churches, you'll see through some of their activities, some of their culture that's incorporated, especially in terms of giving, uh, travel hymns, and, uh, and, and in all the churches, of course, the great respect and inclusion of our elders in the local church for that. <clears throat> partially answered the question, but in what ways are they similar? Well, well the, the, the interesting thing about Native American life and the life of uh, how we operate in the church are very, very similar. When I, when I, you know, through my research and just through my experience and my years of ministry, that one of the reasons I think that so many Native people early on had a true conversion to Christianity were the similar values that we have with Native culture, respect, love, the understanding of community and how we relate to one another. And so when early missionaries um, taught from that aspect, people could resonate with that. They understood the similarities and jumped on board. Now, later when, when it was lived out was a different story. Those things changed with the early missionaries in terms of those, them preaching a, a, a message about repentance and salvation. And for many, you know, for many native cultures, that, that was uh, foreign that concept of uh, salvation and uh, repentance because how we live life, much more community was worth the actions of how we forgave one another, how we lived in community and how we respected each other. And it wasn't that, that subject of uh, penalty or penance for how we treated one another, if that makes sense. <clears throat> well, David, you're an elder and, and ordained minister mm -hmm. in the United Methodist Church. <clears throat> Can you talk about your call of ministry and your academic preparation in early career? When I, when I was growing up as a young boy, there were you know seven siblings. Uh, mine, I'm next to the youngest, and we. Uh, my mother grew up uh, as a Baptist, and she was converted to Methodism through uh, Vacation Bible School, small town of Venita, Oklahoma. And my grandparents on both sides of my family were Cumberland Presbyterians. My great great grandfather, who uh, full blood Cherokee, who was a missionary to his people around the area of Venita. Then on my father's side, his family who were all Cumberland Presbyterians but from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. When we grew up in Muskogee, we, my mother, uh, when she and my dad moved to Tulsa, uh, they began attending the Whit Memorial Indian Methodist Church. And, uh, and then when they moved to Oklahoma City, they attended the Andrew Smith Memorial United Methodist Church. And in Muskogee, uh, Fife Indian United Methodist Church, where I've been involved with since I was uh, a young child. Grew up there, active in uh, Sunday school and life of the church, and had an 
elder, the late Reverend Lee Chipko, who uh, really uh, helped to nurture my call to ministry that he knew was there and perhaps that I did not realize was there till, till high school. I was, I was uh, journalism was my love since junior high, wrote, I worked for papers, high school, junior high, went to college, uh, Eastern Oklahoma State College, will see you on journalism scholarships and I finally, finally relented to the call to ministry in my life and went on to finish at OCU and finish my master's degree at Phillips Theological Seminary. <clears throat> Can you discuss the uh, experiences and leadership roles that prepared you for your current responsibilities as superintendent of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary uh -huh. Conference? When I, when I was called to ministry, you know, all, all I knew about ministry was serving the local church. My very first appointment, though, was uh, to create a ministry for Native American students at Northeastern State University, which even today has the largest number of Native American students of any college or university in the, in the country. And Reverend, excuse me, Bishop Dan Solomon uh, uh, called me and asked if I would, you know, help to work, develop this ministry. And I was a student at Phillips, and that was a great, great, uh, gosh, a great ministry. And then after that, I, we have a, a Cherokee church in Tahlequah, so I began serving that. And, you know, my heart was just bent on serving the local church and having a great time with the uh, young folks and the people there. And it was then that Bishop Solomon, I remember uh, the late Reverend Thomas Ruffes came to me, we were at a meeting at Cookson Hills and said, it was around April and said, Bishop Solomon wants you to come to Oklahoma City. And when I came to Oklahoma City at OCU, I was probably the poorest college student you could ever find. And so Oklahoma City was not, did not have great memories. And so I was anxious to get home. When I graduated, we jumped in the car and never came back until the next year, uh, the appointment and uh, Tom said, Bishop Solomon wants you to come to the office to do this new position. And I, I relented and said, you know, I'm having a great time here and I really don't want to go. And he said, well, whether you want to go or not, he's going to move you. So I came, uh, came and then been here since 1995 in various, uh, various positions. My, you know, so I never really thought about how I uh, learned leadership except through watching people that I worked with, people in the local church, and then throughout the year just observing people and understanding uh, how to be a leader in a Native American context, which I think is much different than being a leader in the dominant culture. Yeah. What are your major responsibilities <clears throat> in superintending the OIC? In, in the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, we have, of course, our resident bishop, Bishop Robert E. Hayes, Jr., who presides and uh, is over both conferences. And then they have my position, which when Bishop Solomon was here, was assistant to the bishop. And then in the discipline, all the missionary conferences have a conference superintendent. And uh, after the passing of Reverend Thomas Ruffes, I was appointed the conference superintendent. So that's my main role. And we have two district superintendents who do the normal jobs of a district superintendent. Mine is more developing leadership among clergy, working with the leadership and the uh, laity in the local churches. And since we're a missionary conference, we get about 60% of our funding from outside sources, including the Oklahoma Annual Conference. So I spend much time cultivating that support and, and uh, cultivating that support and working with agencies, uh, programs, and uh, representing the Annual Conference. And also as an elder, I, um, every Sunday I'm in a local church. I'm in Southwest Oklahoma, Southeast Oklahoma, Northeast every Sunday. In addition to ministry that I've been working with in Edmond, uh, the North Oklahoma City Native Ministry for about five or six years that we hope eventually will be Charted into uh, one of our newest urban churches. Just back to uh, missionary work with uh, the Methodist Church with the five tribes in, uh, in the early 1800s, and share your perspective with some of the successes of these efforts. I, I think, at least, at least from what I, my uh, stories passed down and what I have been able to read regarding successes of the earliest days of Indian Methodism, goes back to what Dr. Tash Smith writes about in his book and that was the leadership of Native American people in the local church. You know, the one of the remark remarkable things when you think about the history of the five tribes, you know, the Methodist church evangelized among the Creeks and among the Cherokees and then among my people in the Choctaws. It was about two or three years later that the removal period began of the five tribes into Indian territory. And when you read the history of some of the horrific, uh, uh, some of the horrific acts that, that occurred during that time amongst our people, and yet in the midst of all of that, those who were part of uh, the Methodist Church and I'm sure other denominations who held fast to their faith uh, 
and many of our songs that we sing today in the especially in the rural churches are songs of, that I equate to the songs of Zion from the Black Methodist Church songs written on the trail, trails of tears the songs that in spite of the suffering that still sing about hope and faith uh, into this new land and of course upon arrival to Indian Territory one of the very first things some of those uh, Christian communities and especially Methodist communities and there are uh, diaries of soldiers and Methodist preachers who came with our people that document that, that one of the very first things they did was to uh, uh, build Methodist churches in the Choctaw Nation and then later in Cherokee Nation of course all over. So I'm always amazed about the faithfulness of those men and women for what they endured and still having hope and faith in the Christ that, um, Christ that they were confident was with them on, on that journey to Indian Territory. So I think because of their, the faithfulness of those men and women that, uh, that was uh, nurtured in the lives of younger folks and that journey has continued for over 170 years. <clears throat> the General Conference of the Methodist uh, Church created the Methodist Missionary Society mm -hmm. and uh, authorized the establishment of Indian schools. How, how important was that? You know, the authorization of Indian schools uh, is not, al not always a uh, great part of our history. Uh, you know, the early, the early, early days, the formation of, of uh, boarding schools uh, was not a great thing. You know, uh, quite a lot of Pennsylvania, when uh, they began this uh, piece about trying to, they, they always wanted to figure out what to do with this quote unquote Indian problem. So what do we do with these people who uh, don't speak English, uh, quote unquote uncivilized in their habits, and I'm reading from a report. And so their, their idea early on from the denomination and the government was to, for that to happen, first of all, they have to learn English and have to become Christian. And so but some of the earliest models of those schools, uh, you know, were used such practices that uh, that were just so detrimental, literally, to the lives of uh, young children ages of five and six who were taken from their homes and sent miles and miles away to school in Pennsylvania and others across the country. There's a great exhibit at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, on the boarding school experience, and there's one quote that always haunts me, and there's a young boy who wrote, he said, the only way to get out of here is to die. And, and if you visit, if you visit Carlisle Indian School, at the very, now it's the very front of the, of the, uh, of the now I think it's a war college, is a little cemetery, holds about 60 little tombstones of those children who died uh, while at that school. And then on, to top that off further back into the college, under paid parking would be the graves of those children that they never bothered to move. So I think about that and think about those families wondering whatever happened to their children, uh, whatever happened to their families uh, for that. And of course later, later though as that system uh, continued, uh, some of the denominations did a good job in some of the states. Some of the many native folk in Oklahoma will talk about the great experience of the boarding school at places like Shilako Indian School uh, near Arkansas City. Uh, but it was done under a different context than it was in the early, early days of history for native people. And of course today there's a, in Oklahoma at least uh, three tribes that run their own boarding schools, but taught from a much different perspective. Most of the faculty is native, they teach culture, language, spirituality, uh, and it's a much, much different uh, setup than it would have been so many years ago. So there, so, and, and, and to top it off, if you talk to other folk who do research in, on the topic of, of historical trauma, they can trace back so many of the ills of our Native American people, substance abuse, high suicide rates, and so forth, back to that experiences that the great grandparents would have had, great greats in the boarding schools. So folks are still doing much research and studies into the effect that boarding schools and even uh, what denominations did to our people early on. <clears throat> David, the, the current repentance and reconciliation movement talks about uh, injustices mm -hmm. uh, done to uh, Native Americans in, in, uh, <clears throat> in a relationship with the Methodist Church. You alluded to assimilation, which is one of them. Mm -hmm. What were some other injustices, if you will? Are we talking in general or in relation to the church? In relation to the church. Okay. I think as I, as I think about injustice is done toward Native American people by the church, I think uh, primarily which I, I see today was the, uh, was the refusal, refusal or lack of, of uh, affirming Native American people in leadership of who they were. Rather than saying, uh, ta Dr. Smith talks about in his book about uh, the white preachers who uh, 
spoke in disdain for the native preachers because they didn't do things like they did. And it's the failure of the church early on to understand how culture played such a different role in the life of the native church as it would in the dominant society church. And so uh, we, we see Dr. Smith talks about ways that native people took it upon themselves to leave the churches despite the interference of, of the white authorities at that particular time. And I, th I think still today in, in, in the church and across the country is, is that people who do not recognize the talents and gifts of Native American people in the church and outside the church and what we have to offer to the church and to the world. Uh, such, such talented, gifted, uh, bright uh, people inside the church and because we don't always fit the standards of how the dominant society operates and functions, we're often discounted. And I think that's, that's one of the great sins that I see continually, uh, the assumptions and stereotypes that people make about Native American people in the life of the church. When, when I get called, when I get uh, invitations and calls often to speak in churches, they want you to come and do the song and dance. They forget that you have many other talents, uh, educated, uh, bright people who can do as much as anybody else. David, does that, does that include a, a clash of, uh, of spiritual values <coughs> and theology between you know, strong Wesleyan theology on one hand and Native American uh, sacred places and outdoor spaces uh, concept? Mm -hmm. I think the neat thing about Wesleyan theology, especially if we think about the quadrilateral and native theology, is that it, 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 um, it mixes often. I mean, there's, there's, there are many similarities, many things that we have in common with John Wesley's early thought of how Methodism operates in this world. So when we think about um, how we, when we think about, of course, the importance of Scripture for Native uh, American people, which is primary, of course, for, uh, for us that call ourselves Christians and, of course, for the denomination. When we think about his understanding of reason and his understanding of experience, of, of reaching back into the past and saying, let's not discount everything that uh, the others have done, but let's see what we can take from this and use for our benefit uh, for the present and also for the future. And, and we see that happening a lot. I see that happening a lot today in our churches so as, as we think about Native American culture ceremonies and practices that early on the missionaries said, you know, were, were of the devil, were evil. And so therefore our parents, grandparents stopped using those. And, and when you're a part of those rituals and ceremonies and you hear the elders talk about their significance, you see so many similarities with Christianity and our ceremonies and our spiritual practices that are just, uh, just amazing. And we stop and ask ourselves, why, why in the world would anyone ever, uh, 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 ever force our people to stop practicing these ceremonies in these ways. And then today, in, 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 at, least in the, uh, at least among our Indian Methodist churches, and it's very true among Southern Baptists, and perhaps among Episcopalians, uh, others who might have a big presence among Native American people, we see that challenge that we have young people who want to practice uh, their uh, spirituality through ceremonies and rituals, and our elders in the church, and others who still say, no, you can't do this. Not the non-Indian people, we're telling us it's our own people who say no you can't do that but it's a direct it's a direct uh, connection to what the missionaries taught our parents and our grandparents that they're still obeying today so we have to recognize and and and, and honor uh, you know their faithfulness in trying to do what they were taught uh, throughout the generations you talked a little bit earlier about uh, uh, not being heard and being <coughs> has that been an ongoing issue also as well as uh, policy that's been handed down, uh, programs been put in place without the input of the uh, Native American community <coughs> that directly impacted them? One of the, one of the uh, challenging pieces about uh, the Indian Methodist Church, and I'm not just speaking about the Oklahoma Indian Mission and Conference, but the others that exist around the country, is that, is that because our numbers are so small, the church doesn't often pay attention to us. So you'll see resources and programs directed toward the uh, Latino Hispanic community the African-American church, Asian communities. But when it comes to the Native American community, we have to ourselves create curriculum, create programs that work from, from our perspective because the general church isn't interested in doing that for us. Some time ago, we had a resource we wanted to produce through the Native American Comprehensive Plan and wanted the publishing house to produce that. But because it would not generate revenue, they refused to do that. And so we had to find funds to do it ourselves. So that's a classic example of when we, when, we, when we talk about being devalued because we don't produce a profit, uh, that's, uh, 
and that speaks for itself. The Methodist Church, and of course other churches <coughs> will preach the gospel of love and grace to Native American mm -hmm. community, <coughs> remain silent and unresponsive as, uh, as devastating events unfolded, like you were talking about the removal, mm -hmm. Civil War and Reconstruction, white settlers uh, mm -hmm. moving in a lot has, has the Methodist Church ever acknowledged its failure to act on behalf of the Native American community? What was the last question again? The last piece of that. Has, has <coughs> the Methodist Church ever acknowledged its failure to act on behalf of the Native American community? It's sort of, if you will, a sin of, of, of omission as opposed to commission. I think a big piece of the call to repentance uh, toward Native American people that the United Methodist Church is engaged in is, is to acknowledge uh, the sins of the past that the, that the church has inflicted upon the people. And there, there are many conferences that have a direct relation to that. For instance, the San Quentin Massacre, when I was there last summer uh, with the annual conference, we took 800 of the delegates to the actual site of the San Quentin Massacre where uh, Colonel John Shivington massacred innocent uh, Cheyenne uh, women and men in that place. And so it was there at that place where they, where they acknowledged uh, that particular Event. And of course, that was a geographical thing. It was in the boundaries, and Shivington was a part of their conference. Uh, Oklahoma area perhaps doesn't have uh, episodes, events that are that tragic. Uh, but I think the United Methodist Church, from region to region, there are places who have acknowledged uh, the sins and uh, repentance toward those particular, those particular events in the life of uh, Native American people. What about the, the impact of the Civil War and Reconstruction <coughs> on the uh, five tribes, especially in, in Oklahoma? My, my understanding of the impact of the Civil War in, among the Indian, Indian work that was going on in denominations is limited, but from what I've read from uh, Homer Nolley's book and Dr. Tash Smith's book, that it was, it was during the Civil War, of course, churches were abandoned everywhere, uh, non-native uh, churches and others. Uh, there was so much turmoil going on. But the remarkable stories of one or two pastors who would stay behind and still go from place to place, church to church. Uh, I think Dr. Smith, the homonoli, tells a story of one pastor who, who uh, would go from place to place, come home, find his home burned down, and he would still minister the gospel in spite of all that was going on uh, during that particular time in, in their lives. <clears throat> There's also another uh, element in, in uh, Native Americanism in Oklahoma, and of course that's the Western <coughs> Sometimes for the Plains mm -hmm. Indians. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak to the re uh, relocation of the Plains tribes to Oklahoma following the Civil War and the impact of the tribes living on sign reservations? Some of, some of the most uh, uh, beautiful places I've been to, ceremonies and places, have been in southwest Oklahoma among the western tribes who were removed much later than uh, the eastern tribes. And what's important to note that except for perhaps two, the Wichita tribe and the Caddo tribe, that the 37 other tribes in the state were all forcibly removed from some part of the country for that. And, and the Western tribes came uh, perhaps 50, 50 years later, 55 years later than the Eastern tribes, if not longer. And so there, and, and because of where they resided, uh, their interaction with the dominant culture was not near as, uh, as eventful as it would have been for the five tribes. That if you, and 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 my recollection from the history that I get to read and the experience of people I talk to is this, is again this the continued theme of broken treaties, uh, broken promises. You know, time after time after time, as the tribes uh, relented and they would sign treaties uh, in exchange for land and exchange for food. And when you read uh, uh, when you read historical accounts of, of those episodes, time after time, those treaties that were broken and uh, so much turmoil and so much horrific loss of life under the hands of people like Colonel Shivington, uh, George Armstrong Custer. And if you get to visit ever in the western part of the state near Cheyenne, Oklahoma at the Washita battlefield site, uh, the very same thing happened, I believe, a year later to the Cheyennes. What Shivington did to the Cheyennes there, Custer did to the Cheyennes and other tribes there in that, that part of the state. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful, uh, a site where they mark, you actually walk through the trail of where the massacre happened in a wonderful museum documented by the China Arapaho and by the U.S. government. So I think about those, those uh, historical pieces that are still so, so fresh in the minds. For instance, when I, you know, we go to powwows in different parts of the state 
And if I'm at a dance in Powell in the southwestern part of the state, the women wear beautiful shawls and they have designs, writing clubs they belong to. And one particular group at the, on their shawls will have Sand Creek Massacre descendants. And, and that, so that memory is still so fresh in the mind. You're talking about one or two generations removed and folks who, who heard the stories from their grandmothers and great-grandmothers what happened at Colorado and of course at Washita and so that that is still so fresh in the hearts and minds of so many people and the people of, uh, especially the people in the southwestern part of this country whose history I think of removal is much uh, different perhaps uh, I don't want to say harsh or all harsh but much much different than ours from the eastern when I say ours it's the, the, you know, the Choctaw tribe. <coughs> These tribes, uh, the Western Plains tribes, were, were placed under the jurisdiction of the Indian Mission Conference. Can you discuss the administrative <coughs> and relationship problems this created? With you got the five tribes, and then you got the Plains tribes. Uh, mm. what, what were the concerns and issues there? Some of the earliest challenges among the Eastern tribes and the Western tribes. If you have to remember, the Eastern tribes, we you know we used, you know used to be called uh, five civilized tribes. That meant that because of our early interaction with these new white immigrants coming in that we adopted uh, ways of life just like they did um, and many of our Choctaws, Cherokees and Creeks were very wealthy uh, people. Chiefs had plantations even to the point where they owned black slaves and that and that was what qualified us in the eyes of the dominant society to be civilized and so so here here you are have a people who who have adopted the ways of dominant society and and for the most part for many who have lost many of their ceremonies, uh, their religious ways of life from a native perspective. And then you encounter another group of people, several groups of people whose ways are much, much different than yours. People make the mistake of assuming that all Native American people are alike. So you're thinking about 550 tribes, uh, nations, villages around the country, each with its own language, own culture, own way of life, and thinking of how different that was. And so it took a while even for the Eastern tribes to understand the ways of uh, the tribes from the West and from the North. I remember my uh, colleagues talk about early on in the 40s and 50s when in our annual conference, when we gather for the annual conference, we gather in three different uh, sites in, in the state. In the early days, we met at local churches. And so uh, if the Eastern tribes would set up uh, brush arbors, Western tribes would, would set up their uh, uh, tents, but also would set up the teepees. And so some of my Choctaw and Creek uh, friends would talk about coming to the annual conference seeing teepees set up that they'd never seen before in their life. So it wasn't just uh, uh, folks in the white culture who'd never seen uh, natives from that uh, stereotypical understanding who all native people were. Eastern tribes is the very same way. And the thought process is much different. E even, even today how we live our lives, when I, one of my uh, beautiful pieces, my job is I uh, go from play, church to church across this uh, state and, and tribe to tribe and the ways are still so different. How, how the churches in the West operate from the East is much different. I'm not saying e any, either is better than the other, but they both have their uh, beautiful pieces that are, part of who, that are part of who they are that's carried out in worship through song, through ritual, and how they understand uh, God and understand the world. <coughs> David, we, we alluded to uh, kind of catastrophic events in the history of the, <coughs> the, 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 the uh, tribes. You talked about removal again in Civil War mm -hmm. Reconstruction. What was the impact uh, and, and the long-term consequences of opening uh, land in Oklahoma to white mm -hmm. settlers and, yeah. and, and they become the dominant uh, uh, population in, in the state? One, one of the, uh, of course, um, one, of the most diff one of the more difficult times in uh, the state's history were the land runs. It wasn't just one land run, the one we celebrate, that people celebrate perhaps in 1889, but there were several others, and I think Dr. Smith uh, alludes to those in his book uh, that, that he wrote. But the challenging part, of course, for the Oklahoma City area, uh, some of these were unassigned land, so there were no tribes at the time who were here, although there was some bordering. But the difficult part is as more and more land runs started, uh, the people began to encroach upon tribal lands. And so the horrific accounts, the horrible accounts of, of what people would do to take land away from the native people who were there. And so the land that was given to them through treaties was now being taken away from them by individuals. Of course, system did not help uh, at all in that matter, always, decide, always sided with people from the dominant uh, society. So that was a very, very challenging time in the lives of, of our people. You know, the Eastern tribes who, who knew better how to live amongst people who were not like them, 
who were not native, but for the Western tribes, Northern tribes who weren't accustomed to that, uh, at that point uh, would have been much, much more challenging, I think, in my, in my estimation. So you can see why today in the state school system, and many still do it around the state. I remember, remember participating as a young boy in Muskogee of the reenactments in local public schools. As uh, so you can imagine, uh, when our local schools reenact the land runs, uh, how parents and children feel about that particular event. And many of my colleagues uh, who, who will uh, work hard to make the school system stop that, and some have, or some who just keep their children home from school that particular day. Yeah. You're alluding actually to, to a lot of men of the land, <coughs> and the land is sacred to the, mm -hmm. the Native Americans traditionally. What did having to give up the tribal lands and the tribal sovereignty, what mm -hmm. effect did that have on it? You, the, the, you know, what, there's, there's two or three things I tell people about Native American people that I think is universal from tribe to tribe. We're, we're very different, but in terms of our values, one is the, one of those is the understanding and importance of community. The community has always been very, very important. Tribes early on, uh, it was never about me individually, but it's about what's best for all the people. That's changed today, I think, today with, uh, with uh, changing of culture, especially with, uh, especially with, um, uh, social media and all that technology has to offer. But what the government did, the government was always, uh, you know, they, uh, U.S. government and the church was always uh, fairly smart about how they would uh, dismantle communities. They understood the importance of community. So, of course, early on when we first moved to Indian Territory, our ancestors, land was communal. There were no fences, no nothing. It was just that these acres were yours and perhaps families had places where they staked for themselves. But it wasn't until the Dawes, Dawes Commission that came and and uh, the commission that asked every person who's native to come and sign up and prove that you are Native American people, land was given to you. And so this concept of owning land was very, very foreign to people. And so you see uh, uh, folks who still never put up fences but shared their resources. And then you see the white settlers coming in, uh, taking land, forcing land away from the people and right and left. Even, even local churches, Dr. Smith talks about that in this book. Uh, about how even United Methodist churches, Methodist churches, excuse me, at that time would find ways to take land away from Native people for the use of their church. So that, that was very, very detrimental. And even early on, that you'll see that the reason that many of our churches and gatherings are small, the government would not allow for large gatherings of Native American people. They were afraid of rebellion, uh, afraid that the Native folk would, would get together and, and gather arms and come back and fight. So they always kept gatherings very, very small. And that's a big reason why Often they outlaw, outlawed so many ceremonials, sun dances, powwows, all those gatherings, uh, because they feared of, of large masses and what they might do uh, in retaliation to the government. <clears throat> you talked about uh, David uh, assimilation a little bit earlier. What about the impact of uh, trying to merge the uh, tribes under you know, under one conference when the Indian Missionary Conference in 1906 was was uh, done away with and, and was merged with the Oklahoma Conference. What, what was the impact of that? <clears throat> you know, from, from the removal period to the formation of the conference in 1844, October of 1844, that the tribes did very, very well, uh, especially the uh, Southeast tribes, in evangelizing among their own people, setting up churches. And it's even important to note that I share with people that the non-Indian people at that time who would have somehow arrived in Indian territory, setting up towns and communities, they, they, their local Methodist churches would have been served often by uh, uh, Native American uh, pastors. So we, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's very, very important, I think, for folks to know that this, this early days of Methodism and, and the strengths and gifts and the talent that these pastors had to serve uh, local churches from uh, place to place, which I, think is, which, I, which I think was very, very important for us to know. What was, what was much difficult, so from 1844 to statehood, uh, pretty much the native people made most of those decisions. Although uh, the bishops would have been white bishops who came from time to time, but for the most part, uh, native folk were very, uh, uh, very much in control of what was going on. And of course, as uh, the, uh, at the, the land run and when the state was uh, formed, and Oklahoma became a state, one of the very first things that the non-Indian Methodists did was to create the Oklahoma Annual Conference. Of course, without any uh, inclusion from the Native American people who've been doing that since 1844, made those decisions uh, alone. And so you can imagine, you can imagine uh, 
uh, the many people, and at that time, gosh, at least 90 percent, 95 would have spoke uh, would have spoke to the tribal language. So you can imagine here you have a people who don't speak English, who are being forced to integrate with these uh, churches, English-speaking churches, who don't know the ways, who don't know the people. So that must have been a very troubling time. And as I stay heard, I think Hominoli reports in his book, The First White Frost, that the Indian Mission lost about half of its membership. We lost almost all of our Cherokee churches, and although we haven't been able to document it, uh, we, we attribute most of that to uh, the Oklahoma Conference forming and the Indian Mission becoming uh, merged, if you will, into what was then the Oklahoma uh, Conference. Why did that not work? Uh, uh, the integration did not work primarily because of language and uh, culture. You can imagine uh, you know, uh, people who, uh, although the Eastern tribes were familiar very much with, uh, with the uh, culture of the dominant society, that they had ways that they still did worship. Worship was still in the language. And so you think about that in relation to churches that were set up who did things very ritually, uh, very Anglo, and in English. And so uh, folks, who, folks who needed uh, to be amongst their own people uh, uh, for the sake of, of being able to worship God in the way that they were accustomed to from tribe to tribe. And of course at that time, at that time you're looking at eastern tribes. The western tribes weren't a part of that. You're looking at the five tribes and some others they would have begin, began to reach out toward in the uh, far northeastern part of the state. <coughs> we decided to import and capture these Indians for the Lord. He emphasizes, in the, if you will, the word neglect of, of, of the Native uh, American churches just sort of getting lost in with mm -hmm. all of the, mm -hmm. the white settlers. Uh, <coughs> what was the impact of that as well? Repeat one more time, I'm sorry. Okay. The, uh, uh, <coughs> just the, the church become predominantly, uh, the, the conference predominantly white. And, and sort of lost its mm -hmm. focus on the, mm -hmm. the Indian mm -hmm. mission and the Indian community. What, how did that affect the church going forward, the Native American church? The formation of the Oklahoma Conference at Stayhood had a direct impact upon the Indian mission because it was, it was at that time that most of the work that had been in, been in place for 50 years or so was forgotten. So the focus and concentration was were on these new, uh, uh, these people coming to the uh, state and so the focus would have been upon the formation of these uh, predominantly white churches. And so the Native American people, what happened to them was just as they suspected they lost their voice. What voice and, what voice and influence they had early on, no one paid attention to and just moved ahead with all the work that was going on and even from the general church who, supported, who would have supported what was going on. <clears throat> We've talked about the, the current repentance and reconciliation mm -hmm. movement within the Methodist Church, uh, lifting up these past uh, and the grievances of Native Americans. Can you explain the general intent of the movement and the desired <coughs> outcome? I mean, what, what are Native Americans seeking? In uh, for about two quadrennials, I served on the uh, General Commission on General Conference, which is the body that organizes, prepares, uh, selects music leaders, does a lot of the groundwork for the General Conference. And at the time, there had been a service, I believe, in 2004, uh, a service of repentance for African Americans who I believe who had stayed a part of the United Methodist Church. And we talked to, I mean, that's in relation to those, uh, the, for the people who left uh, to become a part of the uh, Pan Methodist uh, denominations uh, for predominantly African American folk. And I believe it was the representatives from uh, a Native community who began speaking to folks uh, in, in authority to say, you know, we would like to have a service of repentance toward Native American people. And at the time, many denominations, not many, but several, had already held their services of repentance toward Native American people. And so we began discussing that in 2008. Actually, actually the conversation began late in the uh, 2004 quadrennium. In 2008, the body, the General Commission, uh, discussed that and then put that on the agenda for 2012. And it was at that point that the General Commission on Christian unity and interreligious concerns was given, uh, given uh, the authority to carry that out. And so from that point on, uh, Dr. Steve Sidoric, who was the general secretary of that body at that time, who began to form an advisor group to talk about how, how it would best, uh, how it be best, um, uh, what I'm looking for, how, how we might uh, honor, honor this act of repentance and what it might look like. 
and that's so it's a process that took several years to finally get to where it was today. And of course, I have to have to admit too that when you think about even the small numbers of Native American churches in our United Methodist Church, there wasn't always 100% uh, 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 a consensus on how that might happen for that. And so, when, and, and that makes sense when thinking about, about the diversity of tribes and people from place to place uh, for that. But it was the General Commission and General Conference who authorized that, and then uh, the uh, Steve Sador who, who carried it out. In your opinion, is, is reconciliation achievable? <clears throat> and if so, what actions will have to occur <clears throat> across the church and the grassroots level to achieve it? I've been fortunate the last uh, four or five years uh, teaching some courses uh, on the seminary level and undergrad level about uh, the church, and we, we often talk about repentance. And so we talk about what that means, and people struggle with what it means to repent, especially to repent of something that you feel like happened, that you have nothing to do with, that happened outside of your lifetime. But so, so what we have sought to do is to, is to make those times educational. When you look at the school systems in this state, and I'm sure in other states, there's so little taught about Native American history. So little taught. I remember being in high school, we had one semester in Oklahoma history, and don't recall very, very much uh, talking about Native American history. What we learned, we learned from our churches and from our relatives and from place to place uh, as we, uh, as we, uh, as we um, go along. Uh, so, I, so, I, so I think for ourselves, for the classes, it's, it's a time for us to learn to learn about the true facts, uh, to learn about the diversity of Native American people, to learn about the contributions, and to recognize uh, not just Native people, but all people for who they are, as God created us to be. So perhaps there, so for those who said there's nothing to repent for, there's always opportunity to learn about, uh, about uh, the past and about how we move forward uh, together uh, uh, to affirm who we are as God's people. How do you see this unfolding? I mean, how, how can <clears throat> what steps will be, need to be taken? Well, uh, I, I appreciate the Oklahoma Annual Conference so much for the last uh, two years that they have been engaged in an opportunity to help educate laity and clergy about uh, Native American history and in particular about the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. Last year, uh, we had persons who presented portions of Dr. Tash Smith's book and uh, to help educate people about the history and interconnection between the Indian, what well, used to be Indian Mission and now the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference and the Oklahoma Annual Conference. And this year we are, uh, instead of a mission site day, we are uh, inviting folks to come to about six of our area OMC churches to come uh, for fellowship, for food, uh, for educational peace, to learn more about the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference and to end with worship. And so I, I think as I go from place to place that one of the key ways to learn is to be engaged with one another. So when you have a chance to talk with someone face to face, to visit with someone, to be a part of their services, that's how we learn. Uh, learning from the books is great, but it's only when you have intentional relationships do you learn about who people are and learn about our, our past, our present, and, and of course, our future. It's a long, long, long process. I don't know that anyone ever gets to that place, but it's always, the, it, to, me, to me, it's that we're willing to engage and to learn and uh, to see where God leads us uh, in this result. And the separate. One of the speakers in the uh, Acts of Repentance of the General Conference talked about it being a, a, a two part mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm. And so, my question is what role would Native Americans need to play in helping achieve reconciliation? I think Native, Native American people, the, uh, well, Native American people, our role in helping to achieve reconciliation is to, uh, to be open, to share, to help people learn about who we are, to, to be honest about the past, to be honest about relationships. Uh, to be able to, to share what we know and also to be able to be willing to embrace and to know that there are people out there who are willing and want to learn, who want to embrace who we are, but there are so many people who just don't know how to go about doing that. And so again, the, when, when we create these opportunities for folks to come and be present with one another uh, to learn about each other, those are amazing opportunities for us to do that. I, I, I teach immersion classes for several places, and, and my students who are usually non-Indian get to learn so much about Native culture that they could never do on their own, questions they could never ask, experiences they would never have unless it was in a class setting. And it's through those experiences they go out and their uh, horizons are broadened, and especially for those who are being, who are being engaged in ministry in, 
the United Methodist Church or other places because it helps them understand who we are and it helps them to understand and educate other people along their journey. <clears throat> David, putting on your superintendent's mm -hmm. hat, <coughs> what, what is the current status of churches in OIMC? The, you know, the current status of our churches in OMC is it's like many other conferences. We have uh, some who are in, uh, they're located in communities that are, that are where the communities are just dying, uh, especially our small towns, small rural communities. In the early, early days of uh, removal, uh, the pl many places where our churches are at today, that's where they would have started. Those would have been thriving communities 100, 150 years ago. And like the dominant culture, our young folks are moving to towns, to cities, to find opportunities for education. And so those churches are struggling, but they're doing a, but they are maintaining their own and, and what they have. The, one, the wonderful piece is that today we're able to begin uh, to start some new churches in areas that we have never been present in the state. Last, last year we had two opportunities, thanks to the Oklahoma Annual Conference Misfortune, the church that closed in Commerce and Malika, both in native communities, and so we were dated those churches to begin ministry in those two places. Miami Commerce is next door to Miami, Oklahoma, which in the early, early days of Methodism, uh, we had a boarding school and a church there, but we have not had a presence there in over 150 years. And the nine tribes in the areas so were very, very excited when we got the chance to uh, to uh, begin life anew in that in that church in Commerce. And the same for Walitka, a small little town that's set in the Southern Baptist community, but an area uh, where there's no Methodist influence, and so we have great challenges, but opportunities that are placed in front of us where we can, uh, uh, for the future, to find new places and new ways to be in ministry for Native American people. Are you concerned about the future of Native American churches? I, th I think I'm always, con always, always concerned about the future of Native American churches. And one, one of the main reasons is that, you know, one of the pluses of my position as conference superintendent and being around the church for 20, 25 years is to serve on general boards and agencies. And the big push today, uh, which I understand, I, I affirm it, is, is the uh, uh, creation of the larger mega churches. And so I, I, I look at the size of, sizes of our churches, which are not mega churches. Our largest church would be 100 people, perhaps in the city of Dallas, Texas. And so to me, more focus is given on the large membership church. And so it makes you wonder about the future, not just of the small membership churches in YMC, but in the Oklahoma and their conferences and across the across the country, so that's that's a challenge that we think about. The other challenge is for us to um, enlist leadership in our local churches. the The base salary in the Oklahoma Indian Mission Conference is about twenty six thousand dollars. I think I think the average I think the uh, uh, the average compensation in the Oklahoma conference is about thirty one thousand dollars. My numbers are off, I'm sure. And so can you imagine how hard it is for us to get a young person uh, to go and say, hey, go get your bachelor's degree. When you get done, go do 78, 87 hours of seminary. And when you get done, come out and we'll pay you $27,000. So who can support a family and uh, themselves on, on that kind of salary? So that's a, that's a big challenge for us is to increase um, the local support and finding ways for us to supplement uh, the funds and uh, supplement how we pay for ministry in the annual conference. What do you say to people in the church who ask, quote, why do we need a separate Indian <clears throat> Why not integrate all churches into one conference, end quote? Have you probably heard that a few times? On, on occasion, I hear folks who will ask the question why we have two separate annual conferences, the Oklahoma Annual Conference and the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. My first response always is that the, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference is the mother church of Methodism in the state of Oklahoma. Dr. Ta Dr. Smith talks about that in his book. Think about our churches that go back to 1820s, late 1820s, 1830s. First church is established, and it's the, it, it's, uh, the creation of the Oklahoma Conference is directly benefits from those Native American people who first established those churches. The other piece that, 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 that uh, for me, the importance of Native American churches today is that if, you're in, if you are incorporated into a larger body, you quickly become the minority. So you quickly lose your voice and you quickly, you quickly lose the opportunity to really b affirm who you are as Native American people. We, we are fortunate in the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference to have about 87 Indian Methodist churches and fellowships. There's no other place across United Methodist Church and maybe any denomination that has 
a conference that has such a great concentrated number of churches in one particular state, of course, Texas and Kansas and now Kansas City, Missouri. I occasionally go to places like I was in Mississippi a while back and I was teaching uh, some persons in lay speaking school. Three churches, one of those churches would have been from the area where the Methodist Church uh, evangelized the Choctaws back in the 1820s. That would have been our mother church for Choctaw people. So they had three churches, three Native American churches, 800 churches. So can you imagine being three Native American churches among 800 churches? And so that means the reason I was there is that no one pays attention to them. When they have to do their own training, they have to develop it for themselves. And so the conference says, here's how you do it, and uh, you make it or you don't make it. And so I look at Mississippi, uh, places in Delaware, North Carolina, California, other places, and the very same thing would happen to the Indian Missionary Conference if it was absorbed. And so it's a chance for us to be in leadership among uh, our own people, to, to, uh, to do what we know is best for our people without having other people uh, other people interject their, what their values are into a culture who, who, whose values are much different than theirs. Uh, just the only, the only other thing I might mention is uh, I, was sharing with, I was sharing with folks earlier about uh, the early days of you know, the relationships between the Oklahoma and Oklahoma Indian Mission Conference. They haven't always been great. My predecessor, the Reverend, late Reverend Dr. Thomas Rufface, tells stories of his encounters with previous bishops and their, sometimes their, their refusal to acknowledge who we were as Native American people, the paternalism they practiced, and that has certainly changed in the last uh, four bishops that we've had in the area, but, but there, they are pieces that we've had to fight for. When we became, when, and this is before my time, I was a child, but when the leaders of the Indian Mission uh, sought to become uh, a, a missionary conference, the main people who fought that was the bishop and the leaders of the Oklahoma Annual Conference. And I thought, well, uh, my, you know, what a long ways we've come uh, in those 30, 40 years for the leadership who now affirms who we are, who understands the importance, who uh, support us in so many efforts. We're fortunate that we were able to work with the Oklahoma Conference to use uh, some of the resources and also some of the leadership and some of our efforts, and we're very, very thankful for that. It's never perfect. Uh, we always have a long ways to go, but we're, we're, we continue to make great strides in ministry together. You're welcome.